to us and what Jesus has done in our lives. As Pastor Brian said earlier, um, the, the sermon topic today is hospitality. What is there to say about hospitality? Well, there's a lot, so we're going to get into it. I'm going to begin by telling you a short story that um, last year, several of us went on a mission trip to Kentucky, which is where all of my extended family and my parents, they're all from Kentucky and West Virginia. So I kind of felt like I was going home. And uh, one day we decided to split up into teams of two or three. We had blessing bags and we were going to go door to door and just talk to people, minister to people, share the love of Jesus with them. And I was partnered with Chris and Chris at the time was a resident of the Orlando Union Rescue Mission. So he was actually living there in the program. And it was pretty amazing. He was able to go on to join us and go on this trip with us. And, and Chris is really shy and he got partnered with me. So poor thing. Um, so, we were going, so we were going door to door. And at one point he said, let me take the lead on this one. And I said, that's great. That's fine. So he went up and and he knocked on the door. And, and you know, in Kentucky, it's not like a community. It's like a house here, a house over there, if you've ever been there, you know, in the country. And so we had walked up this little hill. And, and so he's knocking on the door. Nobody answers. And so, and he keeps knocking. And I looked at him and I said, watch. And so I checked to see if the door was open. And the door was open. So I opened the door and I said, is anybody home? I couldn't have said, hey, is anybody here? No, you got to do it. Like, anybody home? And I heard a voice in the house say, what? I says, okay, if we come in and sit down for a while. Go, yeah, come on in. I'm in the living room. So I said, okay. So we walked in and um, we sat down with the gentleman and he was an older man. And we just gave him his blessing bag and talked to him. And we were probably there at least 30 to 45 minutes. I don't know now. And I thought, you know, that's, that, that's like hospitality. Like someone let total strangers in their house and didn't even think anything of it. And then I thought, what has happened? <laughs> it's not like that. It's certainly not like that right here where we live. Um, I found somebody online who I thought really had some insight into hospitality and um, strangers and all that. So let's uh, watch the video real quick. I was sitting in my house a couple weeks ago, just relaxing. My doorbell rang. This is weird. It's a different feeling when your doorbell rings today opposed to 20 years ago, right? 20 years ago, your doorbell rang? That was a happy moment in your house. <laughs> it's called company. <laughs> You'd be sitting there on a Thursday night watching TV. Your doorbell rang? The whole family shot off the couch. Oh, my God! Put the lights on, somebody's here. We got people. I, the whole family went to the door. The kids were in socks, they slid up to the door. Nobody looked to see who it was. Right, you just opened up the door, you were like, oh my God, look at that. Here. And you'd ask him, what the hell are you doing here? And the person would be like, I was in the neighborhood. I thought I might stop by, see how the kids are doing. They're like, oh, come on in. We're going to have some cake. Your mother had a little Entenmann's. Maybe some Sara Lee crumble cake. Just in case company came over. She made an announcement when she bought it. She's like, listen, nobody touched this cake. This is for company only. Those crap muffins, those are for you, people. You better hope to God somebody comes over so we could cut the cake. She put her cake in the middle of the table, proud of it. And she put it right in the middle. Cut yourself a slice. Want a cup of coffee? We're gonna do coffee. Want some Sanka? <laughs> yeah, that's old school. 
a lot of the young kids are looking at me like, what is that, an iPhone app? What the is sick? Your mother had a tin, brown and orange tin, a Sanka, ready to go just in case the company. She put a big pot on the table. Go ahead. Nobody had a cell phone back then. If your so, if your if your if your house phone did ring, your father stood up and said, "Nobody get that phone. We got company." <laughs> and you lost track of time. Two hours went by. You were like, "We got to get out of here." Said, That's okay. Next time we're gonna come by, you'll be like, yeah, my door's always open. <laughs> now your doorbell rings. <laughs> it's like, what the f Right, your own mother's crawling across the kitchen floor. <laughs> get down my army crawl. Army crawl, get in the closet. Go get the sword in the living room. Somebody get the sword underneath the couch in the living room. There's a sword. I've watched that so many times now. And oh, why is it so funny? Because it's so true. Some of you in here know what it was like for the cake and the, you know, company coming over and the kids sliding. That was me sliding up to the door. And, and then you know what it's like now. Maybe it's Amazon, but maybe it's not. You know, you can't trust anybody. Um, and and I, as I was thinking about hospitality and Christian hospitality, I thought, how do we uh, remain hospitable in a world that is a scary place? How do we live out the call to be a people of hospitality? So I started thinking about hospitality as it relates to the church. And I thought, um, is hospitality fellowship? Is hospitality being friendly and being kind to others? Is hospitality potlucks and welcome centers? Is hospitality uh, not forgetting to follow up on phone calls and giving visitors a basket of goodies? Is it wearing name tags? Is it greeting people? Is it inviting people to Sunday school classes? Is that what hospitality is? I think that all of these things can be part of a culture of hospitality. But hospitality goes much deeper than that. And in the book of Hebrews, I'm going to read what the author of Hebrews said in his closing comments. He says in chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 2 and 3, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. So I'll let that sit with you for a minute. Entertaining strangers, you may be entertaining angels. Then it says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. There's this empathetic um, feeling about hospitality. It's deeper than just being kind and welcoming. It involves how we treat strangers. It's an intentional effort to reach out to strangers and remember those who have been forgotten, those who have been imprisoned, and those who have been mistreated. I read uh, an article by, his name is Tim Blackman, and the article's name is The Dangerous Act of Hospitality. The Dangerous Act. And he writes about his grandparents who used their church to hide Jewish men and women from the Nazis. And he said that as a young person, it was difficult to understand why his grandparents would have taken such great risks like that. And so here's what he wrote, and I'm going to say, I'll quote him. It says, in one of my last conversations with my grandmother, then well into her ninth decade, I asked what kept them from complacency and spurred them toward such dangerous hospitality during the cold winters of World War II. And she simply said, we trusted in the coming kingdom of God. In the kingdom of Jesus, there's always enough. 
We knew that God would protect us and would provide for us. Because of that, we simply welcomed people who needed a place to stay and food to eat, even if there was a bit of a risk. And he went on to say, my Opa and Oma offered food, shelter, and protection to those who desperately needed it. And because of their practice of dangerous hospitality, many of their guests lived to tell the story. So Christian hospitality in this instance was not only about being polite. It wasn't about gatherings where sandwiches and coffee and tea were served, although that's a good thing. It was committing oneself to the flourishing of someone else even though it required personal sacrifice. The Greek word for hospitality is philoxenia. Philoxenia, it's a compound word, two words, philo, love, xenia, strangers. It literally means the love of strangers. And a stranger could be anyone. A stranger could be an enemy, a widow, an orphan, a trafficked woman, a homeless person, an immigrant, a foster child, a disabled person, someone in your neighborhood, a student at the school. The heart of Christian hospitality means to show love to anyone that God puts in your path without a heart of racism, classism, prejudice, or pride. And the Apostle Paul challenged the church in Rome when he said, which was read earlier by Tom, um, but I'm going to read a little bit earlier than he read, uh, starting in verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Many say that Romans chapter 12 is the best written description of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And in this tr uh, chapter, he says, don't just put on an act and pretend to love people. Be genuine and then prove that you love them by honoring other people above yourselves. And be eager to practice hospitality. In other words, we should always be ready to love strangers. This isn't a request. And this isn't just for the hospitality committee. This is for all disciples of Jesus. Hospitality is living an intentionally sacrificial life for the sake of others. So that even the strangers in our paths can begin to understand and experience the love of Jesus. And when we go back and when I was researching the early church, hospitality was highly esteemed in the ancient world. And some of you are going, probably thinking, well, that's right. And we are a very different world today. How can we practice that kind of hospitality that they lived out in our church today? And that's what I want to kind of get to here in a second. But the early church considered hospitality a virtue. It was a virtue. It was also an important part of the growth of the early church. And the Bible study that I'm in right now, uh, we just finished Acts chapter 10. And in, in Acts 9 and 10, we read about Peter. And it says that Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. So now we see we see Peter living with a total stranger for a good period of time. And then we see Peter in the next chapter. He's living with Simon the, the Tanner of Hides. And there are these, peep, these men who come into town to see him. And, and Peter invites them to spend the night with him. So I don't know if he conferred with Simon the homeowner. But he just said, come on in. You can spend the night here. So the role of hospitality in the early church cannot be denied. Which makes perfect sense because the church was birthed by Jesus. And is there anybody who's ever been more hospitable than Jesus? He was the perfect example of hospitality. Jesus put the whole world ahead of himself. Jesus thought of you 
when he decided to give up his divine privileges, become a slave and take on human form. And Paul said that that's the same attitude that we're supposed to have. We should not be selfish and try to impress others. We should be humble and think of others as better than ourselves. We shouldn't be looking out for our own interests, but we should take an interest in others. This is the foundational principle of hospitality. So I want to take a story about Jesus and how he interacted with someone because I think it's a perfect example of what hospitality is for us today, even though that was an ancient culture. Luke chapter 19, I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. So I did a little bit of research about Zacchaeus and Middle Eastern um, context. There was a book, it's called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes. And let me talk a little bit about Zacchaeus. His name, um, they believe actually it's a derivative of um, Zechariah. So that would mean that he was Jewish. So, but he's a tax collector which kind of probably felt like to the Jewish people that he was working against them because he was working on behalf of Rome and supporting those who were oppressing God's people and colluding with the enemy. His job was chief tax collector. So he was a man of, of a lot of wealth. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was over an entire region. A lot of people would have disliked him. And it's interesting about the sycamore tree, which I didn't know this, that because of their size and spread, that the Mishnah notes that they were only allowed to grow outside of the town at a distance of at least 75 feet away. So that means that when Zacchaeus was trying to find a tree, he would have gone outside of the city and would have climbed up a sycamore tree outside of the city. So this means that he had gone uh, a significant way out of town and people believe that because of his role in the community that he didn't want to see anybody and people really didn't want to see him. And the other thing is he ran and that there was no self-respecting man in the first century who would be running because it was considered undignified. So here he is running and he's climbing a tree. So Zacchaeus was an undignified, backstabbing Jewish man who had aligned himself with corrupt people and became wealthy on the backs of the poor, but he was desperate to see Jesus. He was seeking something, and he seemed to know that the answer would be found in Jesus. So I'm going to read this next verse, and this verse is pivotal I believe, for understanding the type of hospitality that Jesus portrayed. Verse 5, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So Jesus, Jesus has just left the city of Jericho. He's outside of the city. He's on his way to Jerusalem. What was happening in Jerusalem? Well, Jesus was getting ready to do what he came to this world to do. Jesus was going to Jerusalem so that he could give his life willfully. He had a lot on his mind. And yet, he looked And he saw Zacchaeus. And if I would pinpoint one thing that I think could transform me, our church, all of you, is the ability to see people. The ability to not hang out with the same people you hang out with every week. And to intentionally see somebody 
If Jesus, if Jesus is going to do the most important thing that's ever been done in the history of the world, and he can stop and see someone, I think that's a sign to us. Find somebody who's never been seen. Um, I was joking with my husband this weekend because we were having a conversation and we're looking at each other. I'm looking at him as he's explaining the situation going on at work. And when he was done explaining his situation, I just started talking about something else and he's looking at me, but I could tell he wasn't listening. Now, ladies, <laughs> so I said... I, I literally just went, he is not listening to a thing I'm saying. So I said, you're not listening to me, are you? And he like, and then he laughed. And he goes, I hate it when you say that. I said, because I'm right. And then he started laughing. He goes, yeah, you are right. I didn't hear anything you just said. So, so people know, by the way, when you're not listening. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. Um, they know when you're not listening, but the really amazing thing is to see people and to listen to people. And, and it seems like such a minor thing, but it's not. It's not. And it's something very easy that all of us can do. Um, distinctly Christian hospitality sees people and is genuinely attentive. The second thing Jesus did is he called Zacchaeus' name. Now, on you know, when you just look at it from an outside perspective, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Um, but Jesus called his name out loud in front of the crowd. And, and Jesus called some people's names in the Bible. I mean, of course, he called Lazarus to get up. He gave Peter a, a, a new name. He called different uh, people in the Bible. But this one was a different situation. It just seemed odd to me that he would do that. And so I started thinking about it. And I... I, knowing Zacchaeus' character, I believe that, number one, Jesus wanted him to know that he wasn't judging him and that he was going to call his name in front of this large crowd and connect with him in a profound way, letting him know that he wasn't ashamed of him. And, and I believe that Jesus was also doing that and calling his name because everyone knew who he was. Uh, so all of the people who were coming up behind Jesus would also know. It was kind of like Jesus is going, hey, Zacchaeus, my friend, how you doing? Just to offend everyone so that they knew that this is what, what true hospitality was, is to identify with someone and not judge them. Because distinctively Christian hospitality isn't judgmental. I actually did a Google search on how many people uh, did Jesus... Uh, call and call their name and and I and it never came up with Zacchaeus I put it in like three or four different ways and then I went Google is just judgy so anyway um, you know I, I have a friend who owns a recording studio in Tampa and many many years ago he said will you come in I've got a client here and they need somebody to sing some background vocals would you be willing to do that without asking any questions I said sure so I went in one day, and I remember walking into the studio, and I immediately saw the client. And the client was a pretty big guy, and he had long blonde hair, and he was wearing a sleeveless shirt, which revealed his tattoos, full sleeve tattoos, and, and they were very scary, demonic creatures on his arms. And at the time, I had no idea who he was. Um, but it was a weird situation that the client's name I found out later was John Schaefer. And John is the rhythm guitar player, the band leader, and the principal songwriter for the heavy metal band Iced Earth. Iced Earth is actually world renowned. And if anybody was into video games at that time, which was about 2007, you probably heard their music on your video games. So I was there to record background vocals for his latest album, which I found out later was entitled Framing Armageddon Something Wicked. So like, I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> where, where am I? So, but like I said at the time, I didn't know anything about John, but, but I didn't allow his demon tattoos and his long blonde hair to scare me away. Uh, this was an opportunity. I remember sitting in this room with him, this recording area, and the brief hours that I had with John, I began to converse with him. I started asking him about his life. I started asking him about 
um, God and, and church and Jesus. And he said that he had been raised in church. He said that um, he went actually to a Christian school and that he had had a really bad experience. So he wasn't interested at all in church. Um, he wasn't interested in God. And so I let him talk, tattoos and all, demons flying off of him and all. And so finally, uh, I, I just started talking to him about Jesus. And it wasn't a hor- it was actually a really good conversation. And the whole group that was there with me that day began calling me the church lady. So I'm like, okay, you know, you can call me church lady. But um, I don't know if he ever really accepted anything that I said that day. I don't know if he did, but here's what I do know. He would never come to this church. He wouldn't come through the doors and come to this church. He was angry at the church. He didn't feel like he belonged in the church. So you know what God did? He sent the church to him. And if I had judged him that day, shame on me. Because the world doesn't act like us, doesn't look like us. And if we judge them, if we start with judgment, we're not being like Jesus. So whoever matters to Jesus should matter to me. And distinctly Christian hospitality loves without judgment. The third thing that happened is Jesus, this is awesome. Think about this. Jesus invited himself over. (laughs) This is so cool. Like I think of hospitality as I'm inviting you to my house. Or I'm inviting you to my church. Or I'm inviting you to my small group. Or I'm inviting you to my party. Jesus is like, absolutely not. I'm going to your house. I'm going to hang out with your friends. I'm going to do what you want to do. And, and I started thinking, you know, he was giving us an example of making the other party feel comfortable. So what we do is we invite people here in our comfort zone, don't we? We invite people to us, and we think we can make them feel comfortable. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to feel awkward, and I'm going to be weird, but I'm going to go where they are. I was talking to the few of the women in our church who volunteer at Choice's Women's Clinic. It's right down the road. And uh, Choice's is for women who are looking for more information. uh, Let me read what it says on the website. Many of our patients did not plan on getting pregnant, and they are facing difficult choices. Our goal is for each patient to make her own decision after she has received all the resources and information applicable to her situation. So this organization shows true Christian hospitality by walking with women and even uh, men through very difficult time in their lives, and they provide support to help them make educated decisions with the goal of giving them everything that they need. And, and if the woman chooses to have her baby, they are like there for them and, and provide support for them. And I know they have baby showers over there. And I said to one of the women, I said, um, could we have a baby shower here? And she, uh, she said, no, we can't have it here at the church. I said, why can't we have it here? She goes, because they don't want the women going through this program to feel like they're being judged. So I went, that's this. Listen, <laughs> take them where they are. Love them where they are. And, and allow the Holy Spirit to use you to generate kindness and hospitality. Let them see Jesus in you. Don't expect them to come to us. Distinctly Christian hospitality takes a genuine interest in strangers, even if it's inconvenient for us, if it makes them feel more comfortable. So let me close with the last part of the scripture. So Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. 
And meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And if we at First Methodist Church of Oviedo would grab hold of the theology of hospitality like the church, the early church did and like Jesus did, I wonder how we would change. Here's what I want to say, the last three things in closing. What if we really did begin to see people? And want to get to know them and take an interest in them and listen to them. People in this church, there may be somebody here right now who says, nobody has ever paid attention to me. Nobody's ever really seen me. Nobody's ever really heard me. But distinctly, Christian hospitality sees and is genuinely attentive. And what if we loved without judgment? And what if we we, uh, weren't ashamed to be seen with certain people? Distinctly Christian hospitality loves without judgment. And what if we were all open to being inconvenienced for the sake of others? Stop complaining about it. Stop hanging around, by the way, in our little groups and our cliques. And what if we decided to go to the prisons? What if we decided to go to the atheists instead of avoiding? What if we decided to go to the drug addicts? What if we decided to go to choices? Distinctly, Christian hospitality is love, loving strangers. Amen.